A few moments ago, uh, we were talking about the, uh, one of the first attempts to add to the gospel was circumcision uh, by the Judaizers. I'm often reminded of that today because I often receive letters, probably two or three a month, from very sincere people who are writing to me saying, uh, you know, I really appreciate your ministry and what you're doing, but the problem is you just don't understand one of the fundamental truths of the gospel, and that is that you must worship on the Sabbath day in order to be acceptable to God. That's adding to the gospel. Well, it sure is. It's adding another requirement to the gospel. What would gospel. you say to someone who says that's part of the gospel, that you must worship on the Sabbath day? My response is that I worship the Lord Jesus every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, if you force someone to worship on a particular day, uh, Paul covered that, and yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's an adding... Another requirement to the gospel, and we know that there are no requirements other than faith in Jesus Christ. I always point out Romans 14, which uh, specifically ad uh, addresses that question that talks about uh, one person observes one day and another one observes another. Don't you judge that one. Uh, you can give whatever spiritual significance you want to to a particular day, but don't judge somebody else because they don't do that. Uh, so this is really an adding to the gospel, isn't it? It sure is. Well, here's another one. Uh, is being a member of the right church essential to salvation? Now, this is very important to me because I grew up in a very conservative, uh, very legalistic, uh, fundamentalist, Bible-believing church. They said they believe the Bible, you know, inspired Word of God from beginning to end. But they argued that there was only one true church. Jesus established only one church, and the only way you can be saved is you've got to be in the right church. What about it? Is that well, part Dave, of the I grew up in a church that also claimed to be the one true church, and it was different from your church. But we do know there's only one true church, and the only way to enter that church is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is defined as the, as the body of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul clearly says, we are baptized by one spirit into one body. So, so the church is made up of all born-again believers. Whether, whether you might call yourself a, a Baptist, and I might call myself a Methodist or another and a Presbyterian, but if they're born again, we're all members of the same church, right? That's right. In fact, you, you even, uh, uh, there, there are, there are born-again Baptists or born-again Presbyterians, born-again Methodists, born-again Catholics even. There are, there, uh, but then there's also people in all those denominations that do not have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so true. And there are many people in the professing churches today that are not part of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. They're professors of Christ, but they've never been born again. The moment they're born again, they enter into the true church. What about uh, this concept that the only hope that you have really of salvation is that after you die, you must go to a place uh, called purgatory? where you're going to have to be uh, severely tormented uh, for your sins and suffer for your sins. And through that suffering, you can be purged and be holy enough to be brought into the presence of God. Isn't that an addition to the gospel? Well, it sure is. And it's also a denial of the blood of Jesus Christ because Scripture clearly says the only cleansing agent for our sins is the blood of Jesus. Absolutely, yes. It is the blood of Jesus that purifies us from sin. Hebrews 1.3 says that, when Jesus obtained purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. When a priest sits down, the work is done. I have noticed here in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. How could it be any clearer than that? It makes the blood of Jesus the most valuable commodity the world has ever known because the psalmist says no one could ever help anyone get out of it's the flames. It's so simple. It is so clear. It Why is. is there this constant effort to add to the gospel? Paul answers that as well in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, The prince of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. There's a spiritual blindness that prevails within the professing church, people so, refusing to believe the truth. And so there's always this attempt to either subtract something or per, mainly to add a little bit more, add a little bit more. Sure, you, you know, it's by grace through faith, but you've got to do your part. That's got, in fact, I was taught that, that uh, God has done his part. That's sending his son to die on the cross, and that's the grace. But then I've got to do my part. What part do we have to do? The only part we have, Dave, is to bring our sins to the cross. <laughs> We come to the cross with empty hands of faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is sufficient to save us completely and forever. And that blood is sufficient to forgive us of any sin. Because I know there's always people who are saying, well, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. 
but it's sufficient to, th there is no sin so dark, so terrible that can separate us from the love of God in the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul Faith called himself the chief of sinners, and yet all of his sins were forgiven by the blood of Christ. Well, it's a glorious gospel. It is. And it's so glorious and so wonderful and so beautiful. People find it hard to believe that God could be so gracious. We need to proclaim it faithfully. Amen. Okay, now very quickly, let me ask you something about the Jews. Uh, there are many Christian leaders today, in fact, some very prominent ones, who argue that the Jews do not need the gospel, that they have their own way of salvation by obeying the law of Moses, and then there's the way for the Gentiles, which is the gospel. Uh, it's called dual covenant theology. They have their covenant, we have our covenant, they don't need the gospel. What about it? Do the Jews need the gospel? Absolutely. The gospel is eternal. It was first pronounced in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, and is to be carried throughout the world. It is an unchanging gospel. It must remain pure. And Paul even addresses the whole idea of law-keeping for salvation in Galatians chapter 3. He says, anyone who tries to gain heaven through the law is under a curse because no one can obey the law perfectly. We have one person who obeyed it perfectly, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he gives as a gift to those who will believe in him his perfect righteousness. It's the only way we can stand before God, not in our own righteousness, done through obeying the law, but in the righteousness of Christ. Again, also, Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he talks about the fact that the gospel is the power of God uh, for salvation. And he says it's to the Jew first, to the Jew first. That's right. So how do we get the idea that the Jews are not subject to the gospel? I don't understand it, Dave. They must not be reading the you same Bible we are. I think I do understand it. I've really, really studied this. And what I have found is that when people discover their Jewish roots, which we all need to discover because it helps us better understand Christianity, they get so excited about it. And they get so excited about the Jewish people and understand that the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. That doesn't mean they're saved. It just means that uh, he's going to do some mighty things through them in the future, as he's done in the past. And they become so oriented toward the Jewish people and what they've done in terms of giving the world the Messiah, giving the world the Bible, that God has promised He's going to save a great remnant, that they start loving them right into hell by saying, you know, they really must have their own way. If God loves them that much, they must really have their own way. And so who are we to say that they need the gospel? And, and to me, that's just loving them into hell. It is. That's the most unloving thing we can do, is allow those who have been deceived to continue to march proudly toward hell's gates without intervening on their behalf. And incidentally, that refers to anyone, whether it's a Jew, an atheist, an agnostic, or whatever, because in this day, again, where people put so much emphasis on tolerance, if you start talking about the fact that there are unsaved people, you're accused of being intolerant. But let me tell you something. If you believe that Jesus was really who he said he was, if you believe this Bible, if you believe the gospel, you're going to have an overwhelming zeal to reach those who do not not know the gospel for Jesus Christ because you believe with all your heart they're going to have an eternity in hell. We see a picture of this when the Lord Jesus returns to save the Jews. They yeah. will look upon the one yeah. they pierced and then they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name and of the Lord. And you would be unloving if you did not present them with the gospel. 